Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome. We're in the first day of the Global Education Conference. We are holding a series of panel discussions. We held the first one on gap years this morning, and we're doing another two today. This is the second of three. Um, Abby and Molly are here. I'm going to let them themselves. The last conversation got so deep so fast, uh, we're going to have to try and match it. Okay. Okay, so Abby, do you want to start? Yes, I'd be happy to introduce myself. So my name is Abby Lindsay, and I am the pro uh, Partnership Associate with Global Citizen Year and also an alum of the program. I spend my gap year with Global Citizen Year in Ecuador from 2012 to 2013. Molly, how about you? Sure. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm the Director of Communications and Outreach at Global Citizen Year um, and handle um, a lot of our high school outreach efforts um, and have been um, working on building this educator nominator program over the past year that lets um, teachers, college counselors, coaches, et cetera, uh, in the school context and outside the school context, uh, nominate students to apply for Global Citizen Year. Awesome. Okay, so let me tell you the primary concerns or issues that came up in the last session. Uh, we had a number of students who said, I'm going to lose my scholarships, my financial aid, if I take a year off. We had other students who said, uh, we had one uh, fascinating comment, uh, uh, one gal said, I'm afraid that if I take a gap year, I won't come back to my education. Um, we had concerns that uh, we have two, um, our two panelists both voiced support for gap years as a way of actually finding yourself. That uh, if you're going to spend a lot of money on higher ed, uh, you can trust yourself to make good decisions and you might as well figure out what you want to do in life before you get into a lot of debt. I think I've covered the main issues. Um, oh, no, and there was a huge long conversation about how late people are becoming adults. So the question I asked originally that prompted this was, how, what percentage, and you, Molly, you and Abby can answer this, what percentage of students who graduate from high school in the US do you think graduate as competent adults? From high school? Yes. Is Put all the job, have an apartment, maybe start a family. Not a lot. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> that answer, and in fact, I saw a smile on Molly's face. Maybe because this is this and this question always provokes this very interesting response of, "Oh my gosh, no, they're really not adults." And then the question is, "Well, why? Why would we? Why would people have gotten through twelve years of education here in the states and not actually be competent adults?" So then, then that became a further argument for the benefit of a gap year. Well, I think what's really interesting actually is how many students graduate college and still maybe are not quite competent adults. Um, because I think that while the, the percentage definitely goes up, I still think there are many, um, many college graduates who are not really prepared to, um, you know, thrive in a work environment. No, I think, and that came up exactly. The guy from there was a guy from the UK who who said the exact same thing. So that's a really interesting question, right? Which is, um, you would think the ultimate goal of one's life would be some form of agency, of self direction, some capacity to make decisions, and yet it does feel like there are a lot of uh, pressures or forces or programs that need you to follow along and for them to exist. Right, so this willingness to sort of step aside for a moment from the conveyor belt, well, all of these companies that provide student loans, the, the colleges themselves, you know, they're, they're not necessarily going to, they're not going to promote necessarily something that takes you out of that track. So it does require a certain degree of independence. So with that as, as a starter, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what you see happening? Abby, you're muted, sorry. I muted myself, sorry about that. Um, I will just start with the program particular that I know a lot about, which is Global Citizen Year, um, 
because that's sort of more of what I'm familiar with than the scene at large, apart from the fact that as a high school student, it definitely, I noticed that there's a lot of momentum sort of uh, dissuading us from taking gap years and, you know, the, the financial incentives of the universities to get you going straight into their, their pipelines um, and those sorts of things. But for me, there were a number of reasons why I decided to take a gap year. Um, among them were I felt really burnt out from being in school and I had gotten really good at being in school for the you know previous 12 years or whatever it had been and I was really tired and I had kind of lost my zest for learning and exploring um, in favor of getting really good at taking tests which didn't feel very meaningful to me. So I ended up finding Global Citizen Year through word of mouth and decided to take a gap year in Ecuador where I was placed with a host family and um, worked an apprenticeship in a field that was really of interest to me and I worked with folks with developmental disabilities in a rural clinic and so I was in a town mostly by myself there was a fellow sort of nearby to me but um, for me the experience of living immersed fully in a community and speaking a different language and having to sort of um, you know learn trial by fire through all of these sorts of in environments and experiences was one that was in the moment really challenging and I think that's one thing that's important to keep in mind is that the the experience itself you don't always <laughs> in the moment you're not necessarily like oh this is super fun and i'm learning a lot because you're mostly uncomfortable and you're sort of leaning into these growing edges but at the end i felt like i came out of it feeling really well equipped to deal with any sort of confusing situation that would come my way or really ready um, to take on university in a more uh charged up way i entered um, my university feeling really ready to learn, really eager to make the most of the experience and um, ready for the classroom learning, more so, so than my peers who did not do gap years for sure. So let's pause there for a second because our second daughter did her gap year experience in Nepal. And I can remember getting the phone call from her, dad, I'm in a remote village, I can't stop throwing up, they wanna put an IV in me, what do I do? And I said, okay, number one, don't let them put an IV in you. Drink lots of fluids. We hung up that phone. We're like, oh, this is why it's so scary to send your child off. Because they're going to experience hard things. Mm -hmm. They're going to be difficult things. But in fact, it's those difficult things like you just suggested that really are the growth experiences. So it's sort of a, there has to be sort of a voluntary willingness to say, okay, I'm going to go into something uncomfortable because I'm going to feel better afterwards. It's going to make me a better adult. And that feels like a generational message. It's a, it's a message that my generation should be saying to yours, to our own kids, hey, yeah, there are going to be things that are going to be hard, and hard actually ends up being really good. So go for it. And, and sometimes it doesn't end well. But you keep going, and you figure it out, and you do something else. OK, Molly, how about you? Uh, which which question do you want me to answer? I feel like you threw out so many big ones. <laughs> <laughs> you can answer any one you want, but more sort of what are you seeing? <clears throat> are you seeing so? Well, like one of the things we heard yeah. this morning was only one percent of kids in the UK do a gap year. Probably even less in the United States. I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's this is something where the numbers are really hard to come by. Um, we had a call, Abby and I, today with a you know private school in Boston that had basically 10% of their class does the gap year. Um, I've heard that around that stat from a number of private schools. Um, I do think private and public schools have different differing stats in this regard. Um, I definitely think it's still kind of the road less traveled. Um, but I think um, everything that we see, I mean, we have nearly 1000 alums so far that have students that have come through our program. Um, Abby being one of them. And, um, you know, the, the data that we've seen is, is pretty compelling that you actually, to answer one of your other questions, you really, um, our alums are entering college better prepared. Um, they're more ready to learn, more excited to learn and be there. Um, and the idea that you like lose your zest for learning or like lose your 
intensity to want to go to college. Like I think, I think that that's one of the bigger myths. I think it's a fear and I think it's a very fair fear. Um, but I think it doesn't match, um, really any of the, um, actual results that we see. I think it changes the way that you enter college. Um, and Global Citizen Year now has 15 upwards of 15 and growing college partnerships. Um, the biggest one with Tufts, we're part of their four plus one bridge year program, where every student who's accepted to Tufts is invited to take a gap year. Um, and we are one of three programs they recommend. Um, so I think colleges have been a little slow to um, sort of very loudly vocalize their support, but they are very supportive of gap years. And they agree that students who take a gap year end up doing better at school. They end up becoming more likely to become leaders on campus, um, are less likely to struggle with things on campus that other students are struggling with. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, you know, every this year, our class, our cohort is 150 students. And just like every year that we see these fellows come through our program and then start college and then follow their trajectory is um, really exciting, sort of like further evidence for the value of um, this type of experience, specifically at this point in life, um, where you kind of have enough um, experience and maturity to self-elect to have a challenging experience um, and um, still have a lot to learn and still have and haven't like sort of set in your ways a little bit. Um, so I think that's what I'll see. I see this um, question that got chatted in of um, if the gap year affects your chances of acceptance into post-secondary education and real quickly. Um, so we're one of the very few programs that have um, a full-time college counselor that works with fellows who are abroad um, and we have a number of fellows who are uh, either applying for the first time to college um, or applying uh, again during their gap year. And um, I wouldn't say that, um, you know, everybody gets into their first choice school just because they applied from a gap year, but we have numerous stories of students who um, didn't get into their first choice schools and reapplied from their gap year. And, you know, the only real thing that was different was their essay was about Global Citizen Year. Um, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, we have these, you know, 15 plus colleges who are saying um, we support gap years and we specifically are supporting Global Citizen Year as one of the more, um, because it, we support Global Citizen Year, because it's an experience we feel like we know what our, our, the students are going to get. And so we know that if you've done Global Citizen Year, you are more likely to, um, you know, reap the benefits of having that transformational uh, deep immersion experience. Uh, I think people would love links to any research. <clears throat> I think uh, we often hear that the, the same is true for people who do a foreign exchange or a study abroad. And so the uh, if you have any access to links or sources of information for that people would probably love to know that i'm really interested in the agency question right which is if somebody says i'm afraid i won't go back to college part of what i hear them saying is that they don't trust themselves right so you're you know you're capable you're making decisions if in a year you decide you don't want to go to college well maybe there's a good reason you don't want to go to college and you actually probably will be able to see more clearly so it see it seems to me that that's almost like a I don't trust myself kind of a comment, right? And if you say, okay, so at some point you're gonna take over your own life, right? So you know, maybe 200 years ago you were 12 or 13 years old and maybe today it's 26 to 30 years old. But at some point you really wanna feel like you're in charge of your own life. And so is there value in making decisions as an individual knowing, okay, I'm not gonna make perfect decisions but I should be making decisions for myself. Yeah, I would say that that is, again, it comes back to who the person is. And if that's a concern, you know, before you head into your gap year, I would just suggest that after a gap year, I would imagine you would have more conviction um, about what you're interested in, what path you care to follow. And if that's different than the one that was leading you to think of something other than college right out of high school, um, to listen to that voice, because I've never ever met anybody who said, oh darn, I took a gap year, I wish I hadn't. But the number of people who I've met who say, oh, I wish I had known that this was an option for me 
or that I had done something like this is pretty much everybody that I talked to who didn't take one. Um, I've yet to have anybody say, darn, I wish I hadn't. And I think that that speaks to the impact. And yes, you're taking a step off of the traditional path, but I think that that's just the, the exact point is to take a step different from the one or the path less followed basically. And to encourage you to find your own voice within that and then follow that voice that you find of, you know, what is it that I'm looking for and why is it that these questions or this experience has been challenging um, and use that to fuel your next steps as opposed to acting out of fear of, well, I guess this is the only thing I can possibly do, so I better just do it. But to question that um, and to follow your own, your own voice of curiosity and questioning, I think is really valuable. So Abby, you were in Ecuador. I was. Luckily, you didn't have to worry about exchange and currency, right? Because they use the dollar. But otherwise, you were in a, in a country that has a, a lot of history that's different than ours. They've got a lot of history with the United States. What did you come back saying, oh, I'm so glad I did this because now I think differently? Is, were there things where you said, oh, I'm actually, my perspective has changed or I'm, I'm going to be a better person in some way? Oh, my gosh, I could go on forever about how, how many ways there were. I think for me, one of the most concrete ways was um, my ability to put myself in other people's shoes because I think when you're totally out of your comfort zone and uh, sort of feeling like a fish out of water, what you have to rely on is other people's um, experiences and input and being able to put yourself in their perspective of, wait, this made no sense. Why did they just, you know, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but. Like why did they have chicken legs in their soup? <laughs> That's a really, yes, I was going to go with like chop a chicken, like twist a neck of a chicken, but something akin to that where you're just like, wow, this is very different than what I'm used to. And initially, I think it was really easy for me to jump into, oh, that's weird or that's gross, like a pl place of judgment. Um, but one of the main pillars of Global Citizen Year, and I think um, one of its strongest suits is leading with curiosity before judgment. And so approaching a new situation like that saying, huh. I wonder why <laughs> that is that way. Or I wonder what the, you know, what am I not seeing that this is how they've practiced, um, you know, it, or I'm thinking of also like religious ceremonies and those sorts of things, or this is how it's been for many, many years. And it might seem new to me, but it's actually not. And so approaching new situations with that lens of curiosity is so important. And I think has served me really well in, in the, you know, in the working world and in college of meeting people from really different walks of life from me and being able to meet them um, openly and really eager to learn from them. I also think my perspective of global inequality and just like shifting my sense of scale on that of, you know, what people around the world are experiencing and how different that is from the reality that I had lived growing up really has impacted the way, you know, that I read the news, that I um, pick my books, um, those sorts of things. And I think even more than just my experience in Ecuador, that was my own lived experience, but talking to other fellows who are living in different parts of Brazil or in different parts of Senegal and being able to sort of process our different experiences alongside one another of are you seeing this, um, you know, this radio program that's in a language that nobody speaks? Like, why is that? That's kind of strange and sort of dissecting um, things that were different and new to us together was really helpful to me in being able to put my own experience in a broader global context. Um, and then using that also to carry forward how I interact with the world today, for sure. Yeah, when you came back, what was the phrase that you used to describe a problem of luxury? Right? So, so somebody would be complaining about something that had nothing to do with like sort of the, the, the harsh truths of life and you've come back from Ecuador. So we would always call it first world problems. And that's not really fair to the rest of the world to say first world, but it's the phrase people know. And we would say, yeah. that's a problem that there really isn't a problem, right? It just, it's part of, it's part of affluence, right? And you were with people who, you know, are, are trying to make it at ends meet every day. Yeah, so that's super valuable. Okay, so Molly, what about you? 
Um, yeah, so one of the things I think of a lot um, is it's actually a grad school class at USC. Um, and basically this professor has built, he's like a, some sort of comms um, a, a, uh, executive, but he runs this class on the side. And the whole premise is that you can teach yourself to be more um, cr creative by being more courageous. Um, and there's like no grades in the class. And the whole premise of the class is that you do things that scare you. And that the more you do things that scare you, the more creative you become because the like fear and sort of like, oh my God, what if I fail? Like c catastrophic thinking has been sort of like, um, you know, like the balloon's been popped a little bit on that. And that I think about that a lot in terms of our program and sort of my gap year that I took and what Global Citizen Year offers um, in the sense of, you know, while Steve, like what you were saying that study abroad and um, has similar results. I think where we come from is like, why wait until your junior year to figure out how to, you know, be a better, know yourself better to engage more with your, what you care about. Like, why not start that before college? Like college is this mega investment and why not, like, why would you wait and when you, you know, most study abroad is junior year, like you're almost done. You have one year left. Like if you discover something about yourself that changes what you want to study or what you think you should study, like, for most people, that's probably too late. Um, and um, so I think when we think about it, or and certainly from my experience, is like a gap year is sort of this, it's like this precious commodity of time where um, there is sort of a path that you're on. It's high school to college, and then if you're, you know, and then you get a job. And that's kind of a path that is recommended. And like, we all sort of live by that path. Um, and I think it does take agency to step off that path. Um, but I also think that when you do that, you know, at 18, then you are just so much more likely to take, to take those chances and follow your own heart and passions, you know, for the rest of your life, for the entire time you're in college. I personally um, transferred into the journalism school um, uh, during my gap year. Um, and spent five and a half years working at CNN before I joined the Global Citizen Year team. Um, and that was a career that I found, you know, from being abroad and seeing more of the world than I had ever seen before and feeling like, oh my God, I need to be sharing, I need to be in a business of telling stories. Um, and this is me being in another version of that <laughs> business. Um, but I think I... I just, I, I, when I think about my gap year, I think of it as being, um, you know, kind of pre-gap year and post-gap year when I think about my life. And I think I am a totally different person um, or not, not a totally different person. I think that doesn't do myself enough justice, but I think I start, I left my gap year feeling so confident in my ability to per, like persist almost like to push through something that's challenging to figure out a way and I think I took that to college and I took that to working at CNN and climbing the ladder. And I took that to take, you know, utilize that here at Global Citizen Year and kind of in every aspect of my life. So there was a question in the chat from Kaylee. She says, uh, what's the cost of a gap year in one of these programs? And there's a question in the chat as well, the Q&A that we didn't get to. It looks like it's gone now. But the question was, what are the downsides to a gap year? So maybe costs and downsides in one fell swoop. Uh, answer to downside is not a lot. <laughs> I think there's, you have so much to gain. And I think that there's a myth that you can be behind going into school, you know, when you decide to go back to college that you can feel academically unprepared or um, whatever. And I, I, I don't think that any of your, what you're capable of academically is going to be negatively impacted by taking a gap year. And I think only improved by the broader perspective you will be able to gain by taking a year to go live in a different way, in a different space. Um, as far as the cost, Global Citizen Year offers um, financial aid and need blind admissions. So about one third of the fellows who do the program are receiving full financial aid. About uh, one third 
are receiving some sort of partial financial aid, and then another third are paying um, high percentages of the tuition or, tuition or full tuition, um, which in our case is about $32,000. But again, like three quarters, or I mean, sorry, two thirds of the kids who do the program are receiving financial aid um, of some sort. And we just use the FAFSA forms that are the same as what colleges require um, to sort of assess what the financial need is. And then beyond that, any uh, extenuating circumstances or appeals for financial aid are also taken into account as well. Okay, and certainly someone could do a gap year on their own, right? And, and they can find ways to, a lot of humanitarian projects now do charge because they use it as a form of maintaining their, covering their expenses. But there are people who do gap years where they choose they want to apprentice building houses or they want to do something else and, and they can do that on their own and do it fairly inexpensively. Okay, so uh, what, Madison, you're in the, in the, in the uh, attendees room. Were you the same Madison who was in the earlier session? And if so, would you like to ask any questions? And if anybody else has any questions, we can entertain them. So I guess one, what are the fears of the parents? What are the things that parents get nervous about? I mean, I think you hit on it earlier. It's this fear that their child won't go back to school. Um, I think it's, you know, we live in a society where, <laughs> not to get too sort of like philosophical, but there is this sort of like prescribed path to success, um, you know, high school, college, career. And um, I think there is this fear that deviating from that sort of like guaranteed or as guaranteed as one could get, you know, you, you risk losing it all. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. I do think cost is a factor. Um, you know, Steve, I, I, you mentioned getting a call from your daughter who like, you know, is asking if you need an IV. I think there's certainly just a fear of having your child like really in, you know, totally really far away in circumstances where, like you're not there and it's hard to protect them. Um, I think that that's a big fear for parents. Um, yeah, those are the ones that I encounter. Abby, I don't know if you want to talk at all about you know, what your parents <laughs> were worried about with you. Yeah, I think, and sort of just to, um, I wanted to talk about the safety question because I think that's one that um, my parents and I spent a lot of time thinking about before I took my gap year, you know, as an 18 year old girl going into a country where you don't know anyone. And I luckily spoke some Spanish before I went, but the language piece and the health piece, and I didn't know where I was going to be living exactly. And all of those unknowns, um, definitely were anxiety inducing, I would say for not only for my parents, but at some level myself as well. But what was re really reassuring to me was knowing, and I think this sort of goes back to your point, Steve, about, um, you know, you could do a gap year by yourself and, you know, maybe the cost would be less. But I also think Global Citizen Year in particular really balances the level of like independence versus support because there's so many issues that you would never even predict that you'd need to come up with an answer for while you're, or while I was there and being able to constantly have access to the breadth of knowledge that Global Citizen Year staff provided was so helpful to me in, it, even in just like preparing myself to go and talking to my parents and talking through like, well, what if there was a medical emergency? And it's like, well, I don't know exactly what would happen, but I know that there are people on staff who could definitely help me think through, you know, if there was a medical problem or a safety problem or, you know, the power went out or whatever. There's, there are contingency plans for the contingency plans as far as safety and risk um, are concerned. And so I think that is a huge um, reason to do a program that's really well established and has good safety record. Um, for parents and then also for kids like it's as an as an 18 year old you're like I don't really know what I'm doing but there are going to be grown-ups who can help me <laughs> um, and so for me that was uh, really huge yeah have you known anybody who's not gone through your program but has said yeah, I'm going to take a year off and they didn't do any one particular thing 
they maybe they did kind of like a walkabout. They went here and they went there, and and did they say, well, I wish I had done something more directed, or do they say, well, you know, even so, even not doing something specific, I still felt like I had time to kind of get to know things that would change how I would think. So I did a walk a walkabout. Uh, I've never heard that term, but I guess that's what I did. I um, piece together a bunch of different shorter term programs um, across like over a bunch of different countries. Um, and I can certainly see where I was able to absolutely get some of the benefits that I think I see from our alums. Um, I do think, however, that I was in experience, like, for example, I was in Ghana living in a Liberian settlement camp. Um, you know, it's like 40,000 Liberians who had fled uh, Liberia during the Civil War and had basically set up a um, pretty um, permanent camp. Um, and there were schools and NGOs and shops and restaurants. And I was living in the camp with a bunch of other people just like me. Um, and we were sort of helping out an NGO, volunteering. I think we led some HIV um, AIDS like sessions and we taught in, taught in the school and we helped, you know, kind of here and there. Um, but I think that's a great example of a time when I was totally in over my head and I did not have any context or um, understanding of like the, really the situation I was in. And when I, I see the way Global Citizen Year, um, I did my gap year before Global Citizen Year existed. Um, and I wish that something like Global Citizen Year had existed, to be quite honest. I don't think I didn't, I definitely was able to, again, still get some of the benefits, but I think I wasn't able to maximize my experience as much as I see from our alums. Um, another thing that our program does is we have a pre-departure training and a re-entry training. So the whole cohort of fellows is together for a week in California before they go abroad and after they go abroad. Um, and it was very interesting going to the reentry training um, my first year at Global Citizen Year. Um, Abby was actually there and we shared a bunk bed. Um, it's sort of an all hands on deck endeavor. Um, and basically it's a time for the fellows to begin processing their experience and thinking about um, what, um, you know, how they're going to talk about it to people who weren't there and how they're going to take it to college and what they're going to do with it. And just, just beginning to kind of like break it down a little bit and help fellows recognize that they have um, this large group of students um, who have been through something similar to what they've been through and that they're in the journey with them and they're also going to be figuring it out. Um, and I didn't have that. And I, when I was in the re training, I was like, oh my God, I needed this. I had very, very bad reverse cult culture shock. Not to say that you don't get it just because you go to a re-entry training, but I think the support and tools, I, I just didn't have anything um, to help me uh, navigate my, everything I'd seen, everything I'd been through. Um, I didn't know how to talk about it. You know, it was, I was just sort of like alone after this experience. And I think that's really what you miss out when you do, um, sort of piece together a bunch of different things or don't go anywhere um, in depth. You, you don't get the language aspect of really, um, as Abby was saying, like walking in someone else's shoes. You don't get the um, deep relationship with a homestay family. Um, you've just sort of surface skimmed a whole lot of different places. And that's a really different, um, I think, experience. I am curious as to the return shock like what are things that, that occur for, besides the ones you've just mentioned for yourself, are there sort of common things that you need to, that you address to help them when they come back? Yeah, I mean, I think, the, Abby, feel free to jump in, but I think the biggest thing is connecting them to each other so that they have this support network of other peers. I mean, I was, as I said, I came back alone. I knew no one else who had done anything like I'd done. And I was just sort of like floating by my, you know, in the world. And I just felt totally um, lost. Yeah, I think that I echo that 100%. I also think just in terms of concrete things that were really helpful that we did at reentry training were um, 
sort of practicing to prepare, like to share our experiences in um, like a 30 second elevator pitch in a two minute spiel and a 10 minute spiel and then like a longer, more in depth half hour or three hours and just preparing different amounts of information to share with people in different contexts. Um, which sounds sort of silly, but it was really helpful because then when I was approached by, you know, a friend of the family who I hadn't seen in two years and they're like, oh, how was your trip to Ecuador? Like as we're passing by each other in the grocery store, I didn't feel totally taken aback because I had thought about what I was going to say to that question and how I was going to respond to someone in a time crunch or who, um, you know, wasn't really invested in hearing the long drawn out details of my story um compared to you know sitting down with my best friends from high school and be like hey i want to share my pictures and my stories and i want you guys to come feel more a part of it um so practicing the storytelling bit in in different contexts was really helpful um i mean i think there was also just the, the element of abundance and being back in a country where you walk into a grocery store and you have 80 choices of cereals and I had not stepped foot in a grocery store in eight months and I got there and was utterly paralyzed and indecision and had no idea what to do, um, which is not something that I, I don't think any amount of training can prepare you for. It's just like a part of what you have to, you know, be willing to lean into when you come back. And I think for me, what was really interesting is you, I entered into Ecuador knowing, oh, this is going to be totally different and new and I have to approach it with curiosity and and try to not be judgmental of these new people and I found when I re-entered back into where I had grown up and with people who I loved that practicing that same curiosity before judgment in a familiar context when it all of a sudden felt very unfamiliar when I returned was almost harder because you don't expect it to be hard so then when it is hard all of a sudden it was kind of like whoa this is not what I expected and I need to practice those skills that I just got really good at while I was in Ecuador. Um, but I think being able to support one another through it with other fellows who were experiencing the same, same and different kinds of culture shock um, was so important for me. There's a question in the, in the Q and A. Okay. An anonymous viewer asks with all the growth that occurs during your gap year away, is it hard to come home and have your family not have changed with you? Did you return back to your old self? And I'll add the question, were there things you wanted to talk about and people just weren't interested? Like were there were the times you were like, oh, I want to show you this thing, like, oh yeah. Okay, bye. Yeah. Um, really great question. And I think candidly, yes, that was really hard. I, you know, I arrived home and I felt the way that the metaphor that I sort of used to describe it is. There was a skin that I fit in really well when I was in high school. And that was a part of who I am. And then I arrived in Ecuador and all of a sudden, all that was stripped of me. All of the identities that I had carried with me throughout my time in high school, you know, that I was a student and I was an athlete and I was a daughter and I was, you know, all of these things that were part of who I was, all of a sudden were utterly taken away from me. And I had to reconstruct a new version of myself um, where, all of a sudden it was just me and there was, you know, I wasn't attached to my family and I wasn't attached to my school or anything else. And it was me creating my own version of myself. And I, throughout that year became very comfortable in that version of my skin. And then arriving back into my community at home, all of a sudden was like, Oh my gosh, what the heck? The skin that I used to fit in doesn't really fit anymore, but this skin that was in Ecuador doesn't fit where I needed to be. And so sort of a matter of, finding, you know, the ways where I could blend those two different parts of myself um, because neither one was entirely right for the situation that I was in. And so, you know, blending the parts of me that I had learned in Ecuador into the parts of me that I had left behind at home was really, it was hard, but that was some really good um, sort of soul searching of like what's important to keep and what's not important to keep of these selves that I've learned. Um, and I would also say my parents, I had, I had a uniquely positive parent experience in the sense that both my parents also took gap years kind before they were cool or called gap years of any kind, they sort of meandered about and did their own things. But 
So they were very understanding of the process that I was in as I was coming home. And so in some ways it felt like they hadn't changed at all. And that was very frustrating, but they were very patient with me as I was grappling with that frustration. Yeah. Molly, do you want to answer that same question? No, I think I'll let Abby's, let Abby's answer stand. <laughs> okay, so I have to get ready for the next keynote. And are we at a good stopping place? Yeah, I just saw another question. Um, two people, if it's okay, Steve, two people yeah. chatted in and asked about sort of like whether a gap year will help you figure out what you want to do with your life or if you should still consider a gap year if you already know what you want to pursue. And I just wanted to, I answered it in the chat, but I just wanted to say out loud that I think for me and for Global Citizen Year, when we think about what our program provides, it's a chance to get to know yourself better and that that will help you. Um, if you are still figuring out what you want to do, it will help you do that. And if you already know what you want to do, I think it will just help you know who you, who you are better so that you can um, just excel at whatever you're going to uh, chase after when you're done. So I just wanted to clarify that. I think there are pre, um, there are other gap year opportunities that are a little more pre-professional and we don't aim uh, to be that. Okay. So with, with a caveat, I would say being that you will have some agency in what your apprenticeship is. So if there's an interest, you know, I'm, for example, like I was really interested in working with folks with developmental disabilities because that was a passion I had in high school. And I named that out front and they were able to sort of match me with something that met that point of interest, which there's no guarantee that there will be something exactly perfect for everybody. But I think that was also a really cool way for me to gain real world experience in a field where I had professional interest. So where it's were you not intended as pre-professional, but there is experience, you are able yeah. to gain experience in the work world. Um, that's really incredible experience. Where were you in Ecuador? I was in a region called the Cloud Forest, sort of two hours west of Quito towards the beach. Did you ever work in any orphanages? I did not. I did not, no. Our son worked in an orphanage in Ecuador. It changed his life. Mm. Okay, that was great. We're going to close off now. I'm Thanks so much, Steve, for creating the note. space. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, Abby. The recording Thanks, will be up at some point. Uh, Awesome. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.